Hey everyone, welcome to our Grex trainee webinar. My name is Alexis and I'm a PhD student at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and today I will be the host. Um, for those of you just joining us, uh, welcome. I will do a quick recap about Grex. Um, Grex is the Global Renal Exercise Network. It consists of researchers, medical and allied healthcare professionals from around the world who aim to foster collaborative research and innovation across multiple disciplines. One of Grex's main objectives is to develop effective strategies to increase physical activity and optimize health outcomes in people living with a kidney condition. Therefore, to engage more researchers and professionals, Grex decided to initiate a Grex trainee webinar. And the purpose of the webinar is to provide the junior Grex members opportunities to present their research to an international audience. Um, just a quick recap before we dive into the presentations. Each abstract presentation is allotted 10 minutes, followed by an additional five minutes of audience Q&A. So we do ask that if you have a question, please send it in the chat and um, Hader or myself will be more than happy to help answer it, um, as well as the presenter. And for specific questions to the presenters or about Grex or collaborations, um, we will save time at the end um, for networking. So for today, we have three presentations. They are from Gabriella, Mohammed, and Marbury. Um, the first presentation is from um, Gabriela Palacios Perez. Gabriela attends the Universidad Austral de Chile and is in her last year of her physiotherapy program. Her interests involve the respiratory and renal systems, and she will be presenting her abstract titled Risk Factors Associated with Acute Kidney Injury in Marathoners and Ultramarathoners, um, a Systematic Review. So Gabriella, I will hand it off to you for a presentation. Hey, I'm going to share my screen to show my presentation. Okay. And can you see it? Yes, thanks. Great. Good afternoon, everybody. Today I'm going to present you or a systematic review, which is risk factors associated with acute kidney injury in marathoners and ultra marathoners. My name is Gabriela Palacios, and I'm going to present it. And then Camila Gajardo and Javier Muñoz are going to answer the questions. So first of all, the acute kidney injury, or ACI, is a clinical syndrome that considers a abrupt loss in a short period of time of the renal function and structure. In the recent years, marathon and ultramarathon runners have been diagnosed with ACI, which has led to research into his risk factors. The method that we use at the systematic review was conducted using Prisma P 2015 guide. The search was carried out in different databases of court studies and case control in English, German, and Spanish. The studies with a population of marathon and ultra marathon runners were included, analyzing risk factors associated with ACI. The articles were runners present. Aki markers before the participation in events were excluded. The terms were separated into three groups. At the group one, the terms related to Aki and biomarkers. At group two, the terms related to risk factors. And at group three, the terms related to population. We also use Boolean operators. Within each group, they were related with OR and individual group searches were combined using AND. The review of the records was divided into three stages, carried out independently by three reviewers, 
and in case of disagreement, a forward reviewer was requested. Data such as design, number of participants, aki cases, aki criteria, age of participants, gender of participants, type of race, and risk factors were extracted. The methodological quality was evaluated with the NIH quality assessment tool. <clears throat> this is the results table. We found six articles and 11 risk factors that we can see here. The body weight change, the body mass index, the running experience, and the number of race stages had a significant association with Aki. This is the quality assessment tool for observational cohort and cross-sectional studies. The numbers here correspond to the questions that were answered with yes, no, can determine, not applicable, and not reported, which can give a total of 14 points, where 0 to 4 points means low quality, 5 to 9 means a medium quality, and 10 to 14 points means high quality. So we can see here that all studies were classified with a middle methodological quality. So the results related to body weight change, body mass index, and experience of the runner with Aki were controversial. This discrepancy can be explained due to the body weight loss evaluations were performed at different distances. So this variable seems to depend on race time. The loss of body weight and the presence of Aki could be explained by dehydration, which is definite as the loss of body water of 2% to 3% of total weight. This could be explained in part by the fact that high body mass index has been correlated with a higher percentage of body fat and a lower percentage of total body water. For this reason, it can be considered as influential in dehydration. This factor could be explained by the possible fibrosis in the kidney that runners could develop, caused by frequent kidney damage due to recurrent participation in long distance competition. However, this must be studied and verified by future studies. This association between Aki and stages end of a long distance competition could be explained due to the damaged muscle induced by the exercise or rhabdomyolysis, and consequently increasing stress oxidative triggers inflammatory responses, which will lead to an Aki. Understanding that greater distance in a race increased the damaged muscle and consequently Aki. In conclusion, the body weight shame, the body mass index, the running experience, and the number of race stages had a significant association with Aki. Despite finding significant risk factors associated with Aki in marathoners and ultramarathoners, studies are scarce. So that's why we suggest conducting studies focus on investigative factors present in the systematic review. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Gabriela, for your presentation. Uh, may we see you? Okay. Thank you, Gabriela, for your presentation. Uh, now we are open for questions. So if you have a question for Gabriela regarding her presentation, please, you're able to do it. I will start, Gabriela, with a question. Uh, in terms of practical, practical application of your data and your results, uh, if you have to talk with a trainer, like an exercise physiologist or athletic trainer, how would you tell him, her, to analyze and to take care about the possible risk and the risk factors for AKI in marathoners and uterine marathoners.
Would you like me to type it? Que, um, uh, wait for me a second, because I'm with some friends, Javiera and Camila, which I say at first, and they are going to answer the question. So just a second, please. Sorry, could you repeat, please? That I'm with my partners, and they are going to answer the question. Stay okay, here with me, you. so they are going to answer. Perfect, thank you. Do you want me to repeat the question or? Well, about the body weight that we talk about, it's important that the runner can keep a really good a irritation during the, the race, because as we said, the dehydration can cause acu, that's a risk for acu. So it's important that during all the race, he can take water. So don't have the dehydration that we talk. Is there a hydration recommendation for runners? Well, that's not recommended, but it's not recommended to, to take too much water. That's not good too for the runner. Okay, thank you, Gabriela. We have a question from Alexis and she's asking, based on your review study findings, what are your next steps with this research? Well, now we are working on publish to make an article and put it on the internet. And now that's what we're, we are making with our teacher. And also we are we're still looking and searching for more information about this team. Okay, thank you very much, Gabriela. Uh, do we have more questions from the audience? No, so thank you very much, Gabriela, for your presentation. Congratulations for, for conducting this review study. And we'll be looking forward to have it published. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriela. Um, the second presentation will be from Muhammad Ali Tabibi. Muhammad is a lecturer at, in clinical exercise physiology. His research interests involve the effect of exercise on mortality rate and improving survival in dialysis patients. He will present the effect of concurrent exercise during dialysis on hemoglobin, red blood cells, and hematocrit in hemodialysis patients, a randomized control trial. Um, Mohammed, begin whenever you're ready. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Anemia caused by erythrocyte disorders in hemodialysis patients is one of the most common kidney problems. Left ventricular hypertrophy and its dilation caused by hemoglobin deficiency is one of the most common cardiovascular problems in these patients. 
anemia combined with forced sedentary lifestyle caused by dialysis increases the chance of cardiovascular disease and eventually increases mortality in these patients. And not a noteworthy point is the effect of exercise on anemia in healthy people. Performing aerobic exercise has a significant effect on the increase of red blood cells, hematocrit, and hemoglobin. However, few studies have been conducted on the effect of exercise on the prevention and possibly treatment of anemia and subsequent prevention of cardiovascular disease, which may result in survival of hemodialysis patients. The types of exercise that are recommended for dialysis patients include aerobic and resistance exercise. In many studies, the effects of different methods of exercise have been studied and the results have shown that concurrent exercise in the form of combination of resistance and aerobic exercise has the greatest effect on the studied variables. The aim of this study is to evaluate the effects of concurrent intradialytic exercise on anemia in hemodialysis patients. This study, a randomized controlled nine month single blind parallel group trial that was carried in Abul Faz Medical Center in Iran. The details of this trial were reported at Dialysis Medical Center and patients who wished to enter the program referred to this work. If they met the inclusion criteria, they were accepted after being given accurate knowledge of how the program was to be implemented as well as completing the consent form for entering the program. Finally, 30 eligible patients were randomly assigned to either intervention or control groups. Eligible patients were all adults aged 18 or over without myocardial infarction within past three months. All the participants underwent dialysis three times a week and beside their own desire and consent permission from their doctors was also obtained. The exclusion criteria were unstable cardiac status, active infection or acute medical, medical illness, hemodynamic instability, labile glycemic control, inability to exercise, having severe musculoskeletal pain at rest or with minimal activity, inability to sit, stand, or walk unassisted, and having shortness of grief, either at rest or with activities of daily living. Intervention protocol. Patients were randomly assigned to either intervention or control group since the objective of the study was evaluating the effect of exercise on dialysis patients. Subjects in the exercise group did concurrent intradialytic exercise during the second hour of dialysis for six months, three sessions a week for 45 minutes, and then three months follow up. Patients in the control group had no physical activity during dialysis. In addition, the patients in both groups continued their regular diet and received their prescri uh, prescribed medication. To prescribe the exercise, a series of functional tests were given and Patients were divided into one of three groups, 
very low, low and moderate based on their functional status. After grouping and exercise physiologists prescribe indiv individualized exercises for each group based on their condition. Components of intradialytic exercise included five minutes general body warm up, 10 minutes rhythmic aerobic exercise with music with intensity of 55 to 70% of maximum heart rate. 20 minutes resistance exercise with trapans, dumbbells, body weight, and weight cuffs with intensity of 60 to 70% of five hour. And 10 minutes stretching exercise and cooling down. In the present study, 30 hemodialysis patients with a history of more than one year of dialysis were divided into intervention and control groups. The general characteristics of the subjects have been reported in this table. To investigate the effect of exercise on each of the studied variables, a linear mixed model was fitted by adjusting effect of age, sex, dialysis, history, and comorbidities. In all cases, the main effect and the interaction of the confounding variables were insignificant. The insignificance of the effect of confounding variables indicates that exercise during dialysis can have a positive effect and on male and female patients undergoing dialysis at different ages with different history of dialysis and various comorbidities. And these, and these individual characteristics of patients don't interfere with effectiveness of exercise. This line chart shows the trend of red blood cells changes during six months of intervention and three months of follow-up in the exercise group. During six months of intervention, we see changes to improve red blood cells count and this improving trend has cont uh, continued even after three months of follow-up. During this study, the status of patients in the control group wasn't constant and a significant decreasing trend was observed in red blood cell counts. In this line chart, we see the trend of hematocrit changes during the study period. During the six months of intervention at three months of follow-up in the exercise group, improving changes in hematocrit values are observed. According to the results presented, presented in this chart, in the control group during the study, we see a decreasing trend in hematocrit values. According to the line chart of hemoglobin changes, intradialytic exercise had positive and significant effects on hemoglobin levels during six months. After the end of, ex end of the exercise, this improving process stops and during the three months of follow-up, we see a decrease in hemoglobin levels which also indicates the positive effects of exercise during dialysis. In the control group, the trend of hemoglobin changes during the nine months of the study is decreasing. As you can see in this slide, the trend of changes in all three blood parameters during the six months of the study is incremental and favor 
of improving the patient's condition. In the control group, a decreasing trend was observed in all three blood promoters. One of the major concerns of hemodialysis patients is leaving a high quality longevity in, until the time of transpallination. One of the causes of reduced life expectancy in these patients is death from cardiovascular disease with a mortality rate of 10 to 20 times higher than general population. Decreased levels of hemoglobin, red blood cells, and hematocrit are key causes of cardiovascular disease in these patients. A significant percentage of these patients in the years after the start of hemodialysis and due to increased sedentary lifestyle enforced by hemodialysis suffer from disorders of blood promoters, which further increases the chance of developing cardiovascular disease that if affects their lifespan. The present study showed that performing concurrent exercise, including aerobic and resistance training for six months improves the status of blood promoters and possibly increases their chance of survival in these patients. Moreover, the effects of three months lack of training in the exercise group still shows that lasting effect of exercise even after quitting it. Possible reasons for improving the blood parameters of these patients due to exercise include reducing their sedentary time and increasing the amount of physical activity. In the, in the present study, before the start of training intervention, the hemoglobin level in both groups was less than 12 grams per deciliter, which reached over three, uh, 13 grams per deciliter at the end. While in the control group, it decreased to nearly 10 grams per deciliter. Study, studies have shown that hemoglobin rates higher than 12 grams per deciliter affect the survival of hemodialysis patients. One of the factors influencing the increase in hemoglobin is probably the increase in the lifespan of red blood cells. And, this, and in this study, there was a significant increase in this regard, along with an increase in hemoglobin. The effects of aerobic exercise on the prevention and improving of vascular stiffness and anemia have been demonstrated in studies. Concurrent exercise will have wider effects on patients' bodies in the short term due to the bilateral effect of resistance training and aerobic training. In situations where it is possible to improve the status of blood parameters affecting anemia with exercise during hemodialysis, the need for drug intervention to treat anemia is reduced and moreover, cardiovascular health and ultimately the chance of survival until transpallination is improved. Regarding the tropic effects of exercise, future studies can be on the effect of exercise on anemia and the use of drugs to control anemia in hemodialysis patients. Given the effect of anemia on hypertrophy and left ventricular dilation, improvement in relevant blood parameters is likely to improve or stop the progression of the disorder. It is suggested that in future study, 
along with the effect of intradilatic exercise on anemia, left ventricular changes should also be examined using echocardiography. Concurrent exercise during dialysis leads to improving or increasing hematological parameters and probably prevents cardiac disease and mortality due to hemoglobin deficiency. In the end, as I talked about this infographic on World Kidney Day, you can see that anemia was one of the risk factors that contributed to the mortality process of dialysis patients. According to the study conducted, we observed that concurrent intradialytic exercise improved anemia and therefore reduced risk of cardiovascular disease and increased the chance of survival. Therefore, I suggested that other factors affecting survival in this image be examined by other researchers who are interested in the survival of dialysis patients to be able to increase the life expectancy of these patients and improve their quality of life. In addition, I suggest a study for more than one year with an approach to the effect of intradialytic exercise on dialysis patients survival to examine the effect of exercise on reducing mortality rate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mohammed, for your presentation. You're uh, welcome. Ex excellent study. We have many questions from the audience. The first one is from Nothing. Uh, were both groups homogeneous regarding their dialysis history and comorbidities? <clears throat> Actually, since the subjects were chosen randomly, they were as uh, homogeneous as possible. In addition, uh, we used a linear mix model which adjusted the effect of uh, confounding variables so uh, that it did not affect the results. Okay, thank you for your answer. We have another one from Brett. Uh, he's asking what type of factors of resistance exercise did the patients complete? Can you read it again? Is okay. there a safe time? period for performing exercise after receiving dialysis? Is it that? No, no. The, the first question from Brett, he's asking what type of exercises did the patient complete? We use uh, dumbbells and elastic ones and uh, weight cuffs and body weights. Uh, we started uh, from uh, body weight exercise and then uh, added uh, dumbbells and elastic bands uh, for increasing the intensity. Okay, thank you. And were the exercises completed before, during, or after dialysis? They, uh, they did it during the exercise, during the dialysis, uh, in second hour of uh, dialysis, dialysis, dialysis in time. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, 
there is another question. I'm going to mix my question and Brett's question. You said that the exercise was individualized according to the physical function. And you divided in very low, low and moderate physical function. Uh, what were the cutoff values you adopted? So, uh, uh, actually, we used the elderly uh, criteria for uh, functional tests and uh, used uh, their cutoff points uh, when. Uh, uh, patients met. Okay, thank you. We have another one from Victoria. She's asking, is there a safe time period for performing exercise after receiving dialysis? For example, if a patient receives dialysis in the morning, can the patient perform exercise in the afternoon at the same day? Actually, maybe um, in the in the studies I read it, um, there is uh, there are no um, there were no any guidelines for the days uh, of dialysis after the uh, patients use dialysis. But uh, I think that the people who uh, uh, with uh, dialysis uh, because of uh, uh, they met with uh, fatigue in during the dialysis and after that uh, for four hours to six hours after the dialysis uh, maybe they uh, couldn't do it so I prefer to uh, use the uh, exercise during or the day without the dialysis, but some uh, research uh, I read about and uh, uh, we use it, recommended that uh, the better way for exercising the dialysis patient is uh, the day uh, uh, that they are uh, dialysis, that they given dialysis. And the second and three hours of the dialysis is the better time to do it. Okay, thank you, Mohammed. We have another question from Michael. Uh, he's asking, what about the total dose of erythropoietin and intravenous iron? Have you controlled these parameters? Mm -hmm. well, actually, in this study, uh, we, did, we didn't check this. Uh, however, I suggest other researchers um, examine these changes, but uh, we uh, didn't check it. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question from William, but maybe we can talk about this later. And specifically related to your study, the last question from Susan, uh, which personal supervise the exercise? Wait a minute. So what professionals supervised the exercise? Uh, an exercise physiologist, uh, a nurse, uh, uh, and the nephrologist, uh, and uh, a medical doctor uh, and a nutritionist. Check the, all uh, patients uh, during the six months and three months of follow-up. Uh, and during the exercise, uh, exercise physio physiologists and uh, some uh, partners uh, do uh, try to help the uh, patients to do exercise. Okay, perfect, Mohammed. Thank you very much for your answers and for your presentation. And also again, congratulations for your study. You're welcome. Now we're going to move forward. Alexis, please.
The um, last presentation will be hearing from Marvory Duarte. Marvory has a bachelor's in physical education at the Catholic University of Brasilia, where he is currently enrolled as a master student. Marvory works in a hemodialysis clinic, supervising and prescribing intradialytic exercise. And um, Marvory's research involves the role of exercise in osteosarcopenia on chronic kidney disease and the bone muscle crosstalk. Uh, Marvory, go ahead and share your screen whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you, Alexis, for your presentation. Oh, sure. Okay. Uh, thanks so much, Alexis, for your presentation. It's an honor for me to be here today. Uh, the title of my presentation is Sarkiev and Sarkov are associated with sarcopenia traits in hemodialysis patients. Chronic kidney disease is often described as, as a model of premature aging, and the musculoskeletal change present in chronic kidney disease patients, such as Muscle wasting, muscle weakness, and physical function impairments are common conditions and associated with high morbid mortality. In 2019, uh, European Working Group inserted the new concept of problem sarcopenia, defined as low muscle strength and recommending the use of the SARCAP questionnaire for screening sarcopenia risk. The SARCAP is a self-reporting questionnaire based on patients' perception uh, on limitations in, in strength, walking ability, rise from a, from a chair, climb stairs, and experimental with false. The patients with greater than or equal four scores are considered at sarcopenia risk. Barbosa proposed the uh, direct uh, measurements in sar sarcaf or calf circumference, uh, often described sarcaf. In this study, Sarkov had better performance with confirmed sarcopenia when compared to the Sarkov alone in older people. The patients with greater than or equal 11 score are considered at sarcopenia risk. But association uh, between Sarkov and Sarkov uh, with uh, sarcopenia traits in hemodialysis patients is unclear. Therefore, the objective of this study was investigated the association between SARCAF and SARCAF questionnaires with sarcopenia traits in hemodialysis patients. In cross-sectional and cytocentered study, 30 hemodialysis patients were enrolled. enrolled. Uh, skeletal muscle mass and calf circumference were evaluated by body composition monitor and anthropomeric tape. Uh, muscle strength and physical performance were evaluated by hand grip strength, five times in seat to stand test, and gait speed four meter. Uh, sarcopenia risk was defined by SARCAF and SARCAF, 
problems, problem sarcopenia by low hand grip strength or low seat to stand test or low skeletal muscle mass and confirm sarcopenia uh, according to the European work group by low hand grip strength and low skeletal muscle mass. So the prevalence of sarcopenia risk by SARCAP was 23% and by SARCAP 40%. Problem sarcopenia by low skeletal muscle mass 30%. Probable, probable sarcopenia by hand grip strength and sequencing test was the same prevalence, 23%. And only two patients with confirmed sarcopenia according to the European Work Group 2. Uh, the correlations analysis showed uh, SARCAF and SARCAF and SARCAF uh, were negatively associated with hand grip strength and gait speed. In addition, in contrast, only SARCAF was associated with a uh, to instead test. In addition, only SARCAF was associated with problem sarcopenia by hand grip strength. Well, in adjusted binary, binary logistic regression model, showed that uh, each incre one increase in SARCAF score uh, was associated with 20% 20 higher risk for problem sarcopenia by hand grip strength. And those patients with SARCAF greater than or equal 11 score showed a seven-fold higher risk for problem sarcopenia by hand grip strength. strength. Uh, uh, in relation in kappa analysis, uh, sarcopenia risk by SARCAF showed a moderate ag agreement with slowness and SARCAF uh, showed moderate agreement with problem sarcopenia by hand grip strength and slowness. Uh, so, sarcopenia risk by SARCAF was twice as high as SARCAF. Probable sarcopenia by seat to stand fight test or hand grip strength uh, is more prevalent than skeletal muscle mass. SARCAF and SARCAF are mainly correlated with physical function components than skeletal muscle mass. Only SARCAF was associated with problem sarcopenia by hand grip strength. SARCAF had a better agree agreement with problem sarcopenia by hand grip strength and slowness, but the SARCAF questionnaire only had an agreement with the slowness. SARCAF and SARCAF appear to be feasible tools for sarcopenia traits in hemodialysis population. Uh, thank you, thank you so much for my colleagues and our collaborations, collaborations, uh, Eitu, Francine, Professor João Viana, Professor Aparecido Pimentel Ferreira, Professor uh, Ricardo Moreno, and who the, uh, thanks so much. Thank you very much, Mari, for your presentation. Congratulations, my friend. Uh, 
let's see if we have any questions from the audience. So please, if you have a question to Marvri, you can do it now. Okay, Mahabri, we have a question from Mohammed. How did you measure muscle mass? Uh, in this study? Yes. Uh, muscle mass, I uh, bioimpedância and uh, skeletal muscle mass was bioimpedância. Okay, so you evaluated muscle mass by electrical bioimpedance, right? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, the body composition monitor from Fresenius, right? He, yes. Okay, and we have another question from Angeles. Did you make it an agreement, concordance, uh, for the different sarcopenia indicators? Did you make it? Do you want me to help you, Mahari, on responding? Yes. Okay. So guys, I'm gonna respond by Marvelous because we are colleagues and we have developed this study together. So Angelis, we have performed uh, an agreement analysis for the sarcopenia indicators as is shown in table four. So when we analyzed uh, the SARCAF, SARCAF agreement, we have only seen agreement with slowness and we, when we analyze the agreement of SARCOF with other sarcopenia indicators, we have seen the same agreement with slowness and also with uh, low hand grip strength. Uh, we have one question from Shelly. The first one, would you recommend SARCAF is better than SARCOF? Which oh. one is better, Mavi? Uh, in this study, observe with uh, no have difference in SARCAF and SARCAF, but both uh, uh, will, will be in clinical practice, uh, uh, both, both uh, <laughs> Me ajudei, Heitor, que eu tô okay. nervoso, cara. <laughs> so, uh, Shelly, we believe that uh, Sarkov would be better, would be more associated with sarcopenia traits, as we have seen, uh, especially in low hand grip strength uh, sarcopenia trait. Uh, but if we do not tape, uh, if you do not have an anthropometric tape to measure cough circumference, SARCAF uh, is also recommended, but adding a direct measurement, which is the cough circumference to the SARCAF questionnaire, uh, would have a stronger agreement and would be more associated with sarcopenia traits. And regarding your second question about this skeletal muscle mass assessment, we have assessed it on a dialysis day before dialysis. So it has been assessed before dialysis on a midweek dialysis session. Thanks for your question, Shelly. We have another question from Paula. Uh, in order to prescribe exercise, do you think it would be necessary to measure not only sarcopenia, but also protein energy wasting? Uh, can I respond, Mavri? Uh, can I respond? Yes, yes. 
Also, okay. protein is complementing it. Okay. So, Paula, we believe uh, evaluating protein energy wasting would show uh, a more catabolic uh, situation of the patient. And it could be also be included in the baseline assessments to understand what is the catabolic conditions of the patients. So it would be totally added to sarcopenia. So thank you very much, Marvati, for your presentation. Uh, and thanks for your answers. Uh, and thanks everyone for doing the questions. Thank you, Hater. Um, so for those who are not a member of Grex, um, remember to register for a membership. You can do this by um, logging on to this link below. Um, that way you are up to date on the next webinar and other events that we have coming up. And if you're interested in submitting an abstract for future Grex webinars, submissions are open um, now through August 29th, where you can also use the link below to um, upload an abstract. Um, we would also like to remind you all of our upcoming events. The next Grex training webinar will be September 29th. Um, same time. Um, and we will also be hosting a joint Twitter journal club with Nephrology Journal Club July 6th and 7th, depending on what time zone you are in. And like I said before, the call for abstract submissions are open now through August 29th with a decision pending um, no later than September 3rd. On behalf of the Grex Training Committee, we thank you all for attending today's webinar. Everyone is welcome to stay as um, we will now open it up for uh, discussion. Thank you, Alexis. I'm going to take a question from William uh, during Mohammed's presentation. Uh, Mohammed and everybody here, <laughs> what limitations do you foresee in the implementation of a similar interdialytic exercise program you perform in your study on a larger scale? So what limitations do you see to implement your study in a large scale? I think it uh, seems that uh, there is no any limitation uh, to design uh, this uh, like this uh, large scale uh, research uh, but individual exercise uh, as you know is uh, difficult uh, to design and uh, more difficult to uh, do it uh, so uh, i think uh, a large scale may be sometimes in uh, uh, unnecessary because uh, uh, for example in this uh, in our study we use linear mix model and uh, uh, with uh, 30 uh, 30 percent 30 percent uh, patients and uh, uh, we uh, catch the results that we want so uh, in large scale uh, maybe uh, because of these methods uh, are, are uh, unnecessary. I believe uh, William's questions, Mohammed, was about implement exercise programs as clinical routine. For example, we have been implementing exercise programs here in Brazil and the lack of funding to buy the equipment is a limitation. And also the lack of exercise professionals or uh, exercise specialist professionals is also a limitation. So what is the reality in Iran? Do you have uh, exercise in all dialysis clinics or this is something only that you done in your study? 
Uh, unfortunately, uh, it's not. Uh, we just uh, uh, one center, uh, as I said, Abol Faz Medical Center. Uh, 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 are um, they uh, using exercise during dialysis uh, and uh, uh, other centers? Unfortunately, didn't. And I hope so. Uh, it in the near uh, near future, all the centers uh, do to this study. Uh, do it well. Okay, thank you for your answer, Mohammed. Does sure. anyone want to, to contribute on William's questions about limitations to implement exercise? Thank you, William, for your uh, question. Very interesting. So yeah, I believe we we are done. So thanks everyone for having joined us today. We hope to see you in the Twitter Journal Club very soon, and also in September to the next Jurex trainee webinar. So please submit your abstracts, and it will be a pleasure to see then introduce it here. See you next time, guys. Bye-bye.